everyone welcome to this week's youtube video this week we're going to be releasing one of the patreon videos this is to first part in a two-part series on how to paint this backdrop so this is definitely designed for more display quality if you're going to be entering competitions or anything like that as always i hope it's helpful if you do want to support feel free to check out the patreon for more in-depth video tutorials as well as options for one-to-one -one tuition link is in the description below and i'm available for commissions as always Regardless of that, thank you everyone for the support. It means a huge amount. I hope this video is helpful. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And here we go. The first stage of painting this is we need to paint the actual background itself. Now, I've used an airbrush for this and I'm gonna explain the process, but it's worth noting you don't have to use an airbrush. I'm gonna put a link in the description below for one of the free YouTube videos, which are where I paint a brass scorpion using nothing but a makeup brush. That would be a good substitute if you don't have an airbrush. So you do not need an airbrush for this. Having said that, I've used an airbrush because it was faster. So the colors that I've just put into the pot are Vallejo Game Color Sick, Game Air Sick Green and Scale 75 Ink Intensity White Ink. I'm then adding equal amounts of water and equal amounts of Vallejo Flow Improver. So if I have, so basically the idea is I have 50% paint and then 25% water, 25% Flow Improver. So 50% paint and then 50% of a mix, equal mix of Flow Improver and water. That's my, that's my fallback mix for my airbrush ratio. Sometimes, depending on what I want to do, I will go a lot thinner and you'll see that later on and I'll try and explain as I go. Worth noting, don't fill up your cup that much um, in the airbrush. So the airbrush that I'm using is a Badger Patriot 105, my workhorse airbrush. I love this airbrush. It's actually my favorite one. Um, I also have a Infinity, Harder and Steinbeck Infinity, which is great, but I actually prefer the Patriot 105 is what it is. My compressor is set to around 30 PSI. That is a little bit high, but I personally just like working with a high PSI on my compressor. So you do you. If you're struggling to control it, then drop the PSI a little bit and that will help. And the idea here is nice and simple, building up a very fast, solid base coat. Now, when it comes to this, what we need to, what you need to be aware of is when you're painting over plastic card, the paint does not dry as fast as when you're painting a miniature. I'm not going to lie, no idea why that is. I could not work out what the difference was other than obviously it's a different material. I don't know what it is, but there's loads of occasions while I'm painting this model with both airbrush and brush that I forget that and it ends up coming to bite me in the backside. So just something to think about when you're putting paint down on this material, takes much much longer to dry so just be patient and keep an eye on it to make sure that it is that it is actually dry you can see it looks really patchy at the moment i'm going to speed it up now because you don't need to see me building up you don't need to see it in slow motion building up base coats you can see how patchy it is all i'm doing you can see also as i move it you can see how wet the plastic card is now normally my general rule is once i start seeing the paint is wet I stop airbrushing over it because that's when you start getting puddles, start getting speckles, not speckles, sorry, you start getting webbing. So what you're not really seeing in between this is I'm using a hairdryer to, to dry it between paint layers. And you can see how wet it is. Normally I wouldn't really allow it to get to that stage, but as I said, the plastic card really is a problem here. If anyone's, in all seriousness, if anyone's got any suggestions on how to prep the plastic card better, let me know. All I've done is just primed it with the standard primer that I use, which is the Halfords Gray Car Primer. So the hairdryer is um the hairdryer is just, just saves you so much time. But the idea here is we want just want a nice, really solid base color of whatever we are using. Um with the knife, I'm just scratching off a piece of like basing material that I'd got onto the back of the backdrop and, and hadn't realized. Uh, and you can see the same there. So yeah, nice solid base color. I'm working with, or rather the idea was, I'm working with my brightest value for what I want. I wanted to go start really bright and then go much darker, just because for me, I find it much easier to work that way and I get much more vibrancy. 
So one of the first mistakes that I make is I didn't go bright enough. So I end up having to fix, I, I end up having to go brighter anyway, but it's worth noting there's going to be plenty of mistakes in this, in this video because backdrops are not something that I do a huge amount of, although this one came out really nice and I'm really happy with it. There's always huge amounts of room for improvement and I'm going to show that as well. At the end of this, I'm going to be going over what I could have done better. I got some great feedback from some friends um, and we'll be going over all of that. You can see I'm mixing up paint again. So I'm using that previous paint that I used, the previous mix of that 50-50 of paint and flow improver and water mix. I'm going darker here, but what you'll notice is I'm specifically using black and the priority here is not necessarily that I'm going with a darker green. The, the priority here is I want to go to a desaturated green. I don't want this backdrop very vibrant. I'm going to have spots of saturation in the backdrop to help draw my eye to where I want it to go, but I don't want a lot of saturation in this. So the whole time that I'm working with this initial transition at the back, I'm keeping it very gray. It's much closer to the gray, white, black kind of area rather than the nice vibrant greens. If you're unsure about mixing your paints, if you're unsure about mixing your, um, your airbrush thinner mix, what I would suggest you do is mix it separate every time. So for example, what I've done is I mixed up my original green, obviously, and then I just added brown to what was left over, added a little bit of flow improver, added a little bit of water to keep my consistency where I wanted it. But if you're struggling, if you're not very experienced with airbrushing or you're not too sure about what your ratios should be, just mix up a new batch. I know it's a bit of a waste of paint, but if you mix up a new mix of paint, and a new mix of water and flow improver, what will happen is, is you'll get equal amounts. You can see at the moment, I'm starting to go, starting to go over this backdrop with the darker paint. Now, the idea with this backdrop is I want a very bright center towards the top of the backdrop in the middle. And then I wanna get darker, the closer towards the edges of the backdrop, the two side edges, and darker towards the bottom. So I'm going to gradually build up this soft transition from that light area in the middle to the dark area around the edges. And the reason for this is I want to, I want to hide the join point between the backdrop and the base, where that backdrop in that corner at the back, just here, where that backdrop meets the base. I don't really want to have that viewable really. So I'm gonna cover it in things like leaves and that sort of stuff later. Um, I'm gonna make it really dark so it's not a feature. The idea being is that because of that's gonna be a very sharp angle in the middle of this, it kind of makes you, it doesn't help towards the illusion. You lose immersion in the piece. So for me, I want to, I want to downplay that as much as possible. Now with the transition on this, I'm gonna speed this up here. Uh, but with the transition on this, you're going to start to see that the transition is not great. You can already see between that light green and that darker green, there's there's quite a harsh jump to it. This was actually me struggling as much as I'm really experienced when it comes to airbrushing and don't really have a problem with it. Again, the the way the paint is behaving on the backdrop is actually causing me some issues. So don't panic about it for two reasons. First of all, you can easily go back with your brighter color and just smooth out your transition. Or if you're using a paintbrush, if you're using the, the, the method, sorry, I get my words out. If you're using the method from the brass scorpion. It's very easy to fix because I show you that in that video. But the other thing is, is bearing in mind with, with this, you're going to be painting over nearly everything. Like you don't need to be precious about this. You will be painting over all of this. This is just your foundation. You don't need to be massively neat. The, the idea is you just don't want some like really hard marks. Like you don't want the, the, the webbing that comes off when the paint gets pushed around or anything like that. So don't be too precious about it. It's really not a big deal. This is the, this is not the fun part. This is the easy part. All right. Like I'm not going to lie to you. This is the part that's easy. The difficult bit comes. 
You can see at the moment, I'm just going darker and darker now. I'm just adding more and more black. As I'm going, I'm adding more and more flow improver and water. I'm just keeping that thin mix going. As I said, if you're struggling, just, just don't worry about it. Just mix up your paint separately every time. Don't keep adding to it. But you can see kind of how my, what my paint consistency is like just there. You see the paint's really thin, very fluid. The idea is I'm, I'm putting paint on the model that is very transparent and I'm building up this paint very slowly. What you need to remember is airbrushing is a finesse tool. It's something that you should be, although it speeds up your painting, you want to be using it very gently. Don't press your trigger down all the way. You don't need that much air pressure. You want to be gentle with your trigger, control how much pressure you're coming out. Never pull your trigger back all the way. Like you do not need to blast out huge amounts of paint. Your, your trigger is something that you should, you should probably never need to be pushing down to the maximum or pulling back towards the maximum. Because remember, you push your trigger down, that's how much air pressure you have. You pull your trigger back, it's how much paint will be released. So just, just remember, it's a finesse tool, all right? It's just something for you to use very gently to get the best results. So I just washed out my paint mixing pot because I didn't want all the black in there. This is where I decided that I wanted to go much brighter than I already was. So I'm mixing up this paint again. I had kind of lost my ratios a little bit and the paint was a little bit too thick. And I, I wanted a bit of a fresh start. So I've mixed up the paint again. You can see like there's loads of white ink. Now it's worth noting I like scale 75 white ink when it comes to airbrushing. It's very potent, but it's very fluid at the same time. You do not need to use it. Any white paint will do. If you're not experienced with airbrushing, then use um, the airbrush paints. That will give you a better start. But if you're any any airbrush paint, any paints will work. Vallejo Model Color are the paints that I normally run through an airbrush. Um, but if I'm using white, white is just a pain in the backside in general. So I like to use a white ink. Now you can see this center section is where I've bright where I'm brightening this up this is where this is where I, I realized that I was just not I was just not vibrant enough I'm not vibrant not I, I just wasn't bright enough in my values so I decided that I was going to put a big blast of this really bright green white mix just so I've got that center focal point the thing is as well is I knew I was going to need to paint over this I knew that I wasn't just going to leave this airbrushed backdrop. I knew every single part of it was going to have some kind of brush stroke on it. And what that means is, regardless of what happens, I was probably going to end up making it darker. So with that in mind, I went really bright. I went almost to white. Now, what you can see here is I've just put a huge, huge amount of water in this green paint mix. What I'm basically doing here is I'm glazing with my airbrush. So the idea is I'm using an extremely thin paint like this is probably 10 12 parts water to one part paint and the idea is is all of the speckled areas or where the transitions aren't as soft and very really like really gently going over all of it to soften out some of the more speckled results you can see especially at the bottom where the transition is i i want to remove some of the harder ones now i could do this like with loads loads of layers and eventually it would all just disappear but i'm not that precious about it there was just some bigger marks that i wasn't really a fan of but this paint is incredibly thinned down we, we would think it, what i'm doing right now is exactly like a glaze with a paintbrush using that really thin paint just to smooth out some of the harsher marks you don't have to do it it's up to you this is just what i did if you're using the process from the brass scorpion you won't even need to do it because you won't have this problem but it's a bit of a combination of me being lazy and impatient. You know what I'm like. It'd be pretty terrible when I'm doing my own stuff. Right, so you can see it on screen. This is the backdrop as it is. That's This is where I've started. So I've sped this up to like times four. The first thing that we need to do, remember, the base, the, the physical base itself is not important at this point. All right, that's just a distraction. So what we need to make sure we do is paint everything black. Once we black everything out, that gives us a really good foundation of what we're looking at without any, without any distractions. 
The next thing that we're going to do, I'm going to skip ahead because you don't see need to see me painting all of it, but I paint the, twist, the, the sticks, effectively that's what they are, and then I paint the bottom of the base black as well because it's got loads of overbrush on it. So this is, that's what it looked like, and it's a good start. Now, my, and not until much later on do I add any yellows or, or more saturated greens to this, okay? So for the majority of this sketch, I am using the sick green from Vallejo Game Air. I'm using Vallejo model color black, Vallejo model color white. That is it. By using black and white, I know that this palette is gonna be very desaturated and you can see how desaturated it is there. I'm gonna adjust my camera a little bit, but you can see off on the right hand side as well, I've got my paintbrush above the backdrop and I'm matching that paint mix to my backdrop. All right, so this is something that, it's helpful, it's not, it's not a huge problem if you can't do it, because as I said, we're gonna be painting over it all anyway. This is a good point as well to show how different paint looks. The paint on the palette and the picture on the palette is the same as the picture that you can see to the right. Specifically adjusted my camera settings so the paint colors were correct. This shows how different colors look when they're in different surroundings, right? That's why when I did that paint mix, when I did the match, I got my paint on my brush and I put my brush right next to where I wanted to max, match the paint. Remember, paints lie, colors lie. We have these optical illusions that happen when we look at different colors and materials. Really, really important that if you wanna try and match a color, you actually get that paint and put it right next to what you're trying to paint because your eyes lie to you. So with this backdrop, there are four layers that we need to think about. And I think it's probably worth me showing you that on the picture and breaking it down. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we sketch this out. I know you guys are always going on about, like I'm always harping on about sketching, but it's really important. So what do I mean when I say four layers? This backdrop is painted in four layers, all right? So what that is, when we zoom in, you get to see all the dodgy brush marks. So the first layer is the background, right? And the background is everything where there is nothing, right? So all back here, like all this area here, this area here, this area, it's just basically like really inconsistent shapes and it almost looks like it's air. So that area, that's the first layer. And that is what's left over of our airbrushed backdrop or painted background, right? So that's layer number one. And then what we do is we work from that back layer, so furthest away from us, because that is the part that is the furthest away from our viewpoint. And then we, we should, although I don't <laughs> in all cases, but this was a learning point on my part, we should work in layers that come towards us. So the next layer here, if you look, is in the background, we have this little inconsistent outline just along here. This tree here. So that is another layer. That is the next almost like view. That's the next level of distance away. So we've got that backdrop, which is the furthest part away. Then we have the like this silhouette of trees, which are kind of just implied. Now if you look, there's very little definition or details and the lines are not very sharp or crisp and that is for a good reason the idea being the further away it is the less defined things are so first and foremost the second layer gets darker if you look at those trees all of those trees are a slightly darker value than the backdrop not much but enough to show them and we don't particularly want to have a huge amount of detail in them. Now, the third layer, as we zoom out a little bit, the third layer are these defined trees. 
So this is the third layer. And if you notice, they have more saturation as well. So it's this like this tree here, this branch here, these bushes, these bushes, like it's all of those that I've just squiggled all over. Um, so that's the next layer. That's the next distance of stuff that we're painting on. These become far more detailed. They also have more saturation, but we'll get to that later on. They have much more definition and their outlines are much more defined. This is really important. And then we have our final layer. Final layer is the areas that are the closest to us that I also don't want people to look out very much. So the final layer, which is the things that are closest to us, which are these ugly bushes all around the edge. The idea being, you can see these create the frame for the center of the backdrop. They're not overly bright. They're not very saturated and they pretty much go to black all around the edges because the idea with these are, I don't want them to be a feature. I want people to look into the middle of this. We need to paint this in those four layers. So we paint from furthest away and then we paint closer and closer closer our viewpoint gets to us so the fourth layer the first layer sorry the one that's furthest away we've already done right that was the airbrush backdrop now i have sped this footage up because i'm not being particularly careful about it you can see i'm using a very large brush this is a windsor and newton size 3 series 7 size 3 so it's quite large you're also going to notice that i changed my colors i changed my colors a lot like i keep changing the mix of this green because at the beginning I struggled to get a value that I was happy with. But that's not important. I figured it's it's good to show it as well though. Just because like there are a lot of mistakes in this. There are a lot of mis mistakes. Mistakes is the wrong word because for all intents and purposes we're painting a canvas here. There are no, no mistakes. But the, probably the better way of putting it is there are a few things that I regret doing in that in that way or there are a few brush strokes that i regret that sort of stuff now what i will say with this is when it comes to the painting over the backdrop because we will paint over the backdrop later on as in the airbrushed backdrop when it comes to the second layer which i'm painting now nearly all of my brush strokes at the beginning are going down right all of my brush strokes are going downwards i keep those brush strokes in that direction now, this was a bit of a mistake. Uh, I had a really interesting conversation with Bug, who's, who's a Twitch streamer and he does amazing scenery pieces. I'm gonna put his Twitch link in the description for you guys to check him out. This, this was the foundation of one of the biggest mistakes that I made. The direction of the grain on these, on my trees where I put the sticks on, the direction of the grain and everything goes sideways on those. So what that means is, is my choice to use downwards brush strokes straight away meant that all of the all of the texture that I put into this paint was actually opposite to the kind of like the, the texture that was in the sticks in the trees. And that was a bit of a mistake. So in hindsight, I would have changed my brush strokes so they were more like um, a horizontal. But it is what it is. So you can see that I basically painted like two big cliffs in the middle and then I've gone darker again and put like a little border around. And then with this very dark paint, this is almost black. I'm doing these sweeping brush strokes. You can see how I'm just kind of flicking my paintbrush across like over. And this gives me like this, these nice little leaf shapes. So the big thing to realize here is I've airbrushed that nice and smooth and nearly all of it, all of it has disappeared. You can see I put, put the models in place at the moment. I keep going back to this. I keep putting the models back in place so I can see how this canvas, this backdrop is interacting with those models. Because one thing that I do want is where the Pterodon Rider is and where the Chaos Knight is, the Varangard model. I want both of them to have a dark background. That's a really important feature of this. I want them to be silhouetted by darkness or have the trees, the bushes and that sort of stuff behind them. 
So it's almost like I want the, the bright section of the backdrop to be in the middle of these two, two models where they're interacting because that draws the eye into the center of it. You can see I'm just making the adjustments. I'm basically just putting these big old bush marks where both of the models are. And this is the thing, right? This is the first part of the sketch. All I care about is shapes at this point. I'm not too bothered about how neat it is. I'm not too bothered about how my brush strokes look. I've got a general direction for my brush stroke. The brush stroke for the bush is those sweeping strokes where I'm just kind of flicking my brush. The point of that is only it just makes it look like those, those leaves. Now, what I would say later on is I had a bit of a missed opportunity here. I could have made these bushes around the edges look so much nicer if I was just a little bit more careful um, and built them up better. But it is what it is. We'll, we'll get into that later anyway. That's one of the flaws on this model. Now that I've got those basic outlines for where I want these, these distance layers that we were talking about in the beginning, the next stage of the sketch is just to paint on things, right? Paint on trees, paint on um, features. The idea with this is the, the left-hand side one, originally I was going to do a tree, um, and then I was going to do a second like uh, layer of land where I'm painting this green on the right-hand side. I didn't like it by the time that I did that. Um, and I end up painting it up later later on. But you can see how at the moment I'm putting like loads of these little lines. The idea with this was I used the broken Windsor and Newton brush, which has got lots of little sprayed ends. And I'm doing lots of those little bush marks. So how I did the big sweeping strokes with those big dark bushes at the front. I just basically did a smaller version of that. And the idea with this was is Twofold. First of all, I wanted to kind of hide the abomination of what I'd painted on the right hand side. But I also wanted to add a foundation of what would later on be some kind of material, like textural surface. The idea in this case was is I had bushes at the front, then as they get further away, those bushes are naturally going to be smaller. So the point with this is is very early on, sketched in these bushes, and they are ultimately just brush marks. Like they're not, I haven't defined them at all. It's just a build up of these flicking brush strokes with that with that knackered brush and they stay there till the end. Right. So and I, and I don't I don't improve on them at all. And this is the thing that you need to remember about doing a backdrop. Not everything needs to be perfect. You need to think like the further away something is, the less defined it looks. Generally, <laughs> so we can afford to be far less careful. And I think it's really good to show as well because like I'm really not I'm not being like careful. You can see like this is the start of a tree. And I've just used like a big flowing brush stroke. The paint's fairly wet. You can see that it's quite watery, it's quite transparent. Now what I would say to you, right? What I end up doing is I'm working all four of these layers at the same time. I keep going to the furthest layer away, and then I keep coming back to the layer at the front. It would be better, so you don't keep painting over yourself, to do all of the back layer sketch first, and then do each consecutive layer from the furthest one away to the closest one, because all that happens is obviously the closest one needs to be over the previous one. So. The idea being, obviously, if you're looking at something which is closer to you, that's going to be in front of the one that's further away. And it's the same with paint. And because of that, I had to keep covering up what I was painting. Not a big deal, but just think about it. Just just have a bit more forethought than I did, because I was honestly not really paying that much attention to it. I was just kind of having I was having a lot of fun, to be honest. So you can see straight away that I've got a big tree. I've got some rough outlined land masses. I've got some bushes in place. And that's pretty much it. So we've gone from sketching the, the shape of what we're trying to create to we're now starting to give some semblance of understanding to what we're actually looking at. So we're trying to get 
some actual features that make the base look like it's in a jungle. This is where we're at. So at this precise moment in time, I don't particularly like the right hand side. I like the tree, but I don't like the weird curved part. So that's I've already decided that. So I'm going to start fixing that shortly. But what does look really weird is that at the moment we look like we've got these two gates in the middle with this pathway. So we need to break up this very square center. So straight away with my lightest mix of paint, the brightest mix of paint, which is just a little bit brighter than the backdrop, I'm going to paint in just a bit of a random shape. So the idea with this, I apologize for my fat head being in the way, but there was just no way around it. The idea with this is I'm just trying to create something interesting. There isn't really any rhyme or rhythm to it. It's just what is kind of maybe believable. And it goes for a few iterations. So like this little bit here, you can see that I'm painting painting it and I've, I've left like this circle in the middle. In my head, I had this idea of like, this is a big like cliff in the background. And in, in some of them where you see them in, in the jungles and, and like out in, in the ocean and that sort of stuff, they have these almost hollow areas between underneath the rocks where you can see through them. And I had this idea of having one of those hollow areas and then maybe some vines hanging between them. And there was nothing wrong with it, but I struggled in the end to make it so it was very clear. Um, so I kind of tone it down later on, but you can see at the beginning already, this cliff up the top, you can see that I've broken the shape of it. So it's no longer just flat and I've just slapped a tree on top of it. I like the idea of having this cliff, um, and right on the edge of the cliff, having this tree sat there that could fall at any point. So it was just little things. Um, you can see as well on the right hand side, this is a big mistake on my part. On the right hand side, I've done, the, I've done another tree. This other tree is pretty much the same shape. It's also got a branch coming off on the opposite side to the one on the left. It's very symmetrical. So straight away, this is something that we need to think about. We automatically create symmetry and we automatically see symmetry it's something our brains do and this backdrop is not free of it even when i finish it there are certain parts which are symmetrical um and although this was a conscious thought in my mind as i'm painting this i still fell prey to it and i didn't see it until until bug pointed it out in the feedback which was great so i'm going to show that when we get to the when we get to the end of this video, or rather I'm going to split this into two videos just because it's, it's going to be so long otherwise. Um, but yeah, so when we get to the end of the video, I'm going to point out the parts that I don't like that potentially I'm going to have to go back and fix um, and the flaws in it. Not because I want to moan, but because I think it's really important to be showing it and hopefully you guys learn from my mistakes. You can see I'm playing with toy soldiers again. Um, I'm just constantly going back. And I wanted to leave this in so you could see it. I'm constantly going back and putting the models in place. You can see that I'm blue tacking this Varangar model together because I need to see, remember, we'll get to that bit in a sec. I need to see how these models interact with this base. Do they look good? Now, for me, the base needs to be, needs to frame the miniatures. The base needs to lift the models up. Models are the most important part base is only there to set a tone depending on what your hobby is some people like it the other way they like the models to make the base the feature whatever you want to do but that's entirely up to you but for me it's all about the miniatures and that's why i'm constantly putting these miniatures back on first of all to think right are these miniatures going to look good in front of them either is the base that going to overpower it do I just not need this base? Is it just a pointless exercise? I'm constantly like probably 20, 30 times over this, the course of about eight hours. I, well, maybe about five hours. Um, I, I, I put these models back on this base. That's why there's blue tack on the base nearly all the time because I needed to see how it interacted. And at this point, I kind of like the shapes that I have, kind of like the trees other than the one on the right hand side at the top. Uh, I quite liked where it was going. I, I wanted to break up the center at the bottom, which is why I decided to put this this tree, this branch or whatever it was going across just to break 
it up because everything is kind of going down. So I wanted to have by by adding these branches to the trees that I had and adding this one that goes across the the backdrop, it breaks up the monotony of it because everything at the moment is is pretty much all going straight up or straight down. There's not a lot that breaks that rule. And that's why I add in lots of branches later on because it adds a type of contrast. If you have everything going in the same direction, um, it looks very unnatural. I want to point out as well, with the, with the trees, my brush strokes go the length of the trees. So if I'm painting a tree, my brush stroke, if I'm pa painting a tree, and it's like that my brush stroke goes the length of the tree this was a choice one that i kind of regretted later on but again i'll get into that the idea with this is my brush strokes is what's giving me my material surface of the trees so as i build up the brush strokes it's going to give the illusion of the believability um that this there's there's kind of like a grain in these trees or a direction um, it's, it's difficult to explain but my brush strokes and the build up of brush strokes is what gives the believability but the downside to that is because I chose that direction of brush stroke it doesn't necessarily match the physical trees that I put on the base and that was one of the downsides to it and you can see it quite well with with that branch that goes across at the bottom in the middle there because I've used such thin paint you can really see my brush strokes and I've used very small brush strokes I've used the tip of my brush and you can kind of see like it's got this material surface um, which which ended up looking really good and that was the basis of it remember our brush strokes when we don't have a physical model to work with our brush strokes are actually incredibly important because the brush strokes is what sells the illusion of what we're trying to sell what we're trying to create now the, the left hand side I'm quite happy with just because I know where I'm going to go with that now. The shapes make sense to me, so I don't work too much with the left hand side anymore. But the right hand side just looks absolutely terrible to me. So the first thing that I want to do is this big old swervy line that I want to put that I've got in the middle. I'm going to turn that into a feature like this is going to be a really big one of the biggest trees or rather the biggest tree that we have in this backdrop. So the first thing that I do is widen it and then add a couple of branches and straight away that changes the, the dynamic of the center. Now, and the final part here, what I want to do is I need to start kind of integrating the backdrop that we airbrushed furthest away, the furthest view away, and also that next viewpoint, just the background silhouettes of the trees. So the first thing that I need to do is it doesn't make sense that I have a perfectly smooth background. Things just wouldn't work like that. There's going to be just stuff. This is supposed to be a jungle. Doesn't matter how far away you look, there's always going to be like little vines and all sorts of stuff. So keeping in mind those downward brush strokes, which I'm keeping as a theme running through this backdrop, the first thing that I do is I mix up a glaze consistency of paint. So this is, this really is quite thin actually. So this is like six, seven, maybe eight parts water. And the idea is removing the excess paint from that brush. Check out the glazing video if you're not sure. It'll give you all the information you need. And what I'm doing is I'm glazing with a downward brush stroke, I'm glazing over the backdrop. And the idea is, is all it's done is it's just broken that flat, perfect smooth airbrushed finish now i'm going to do that a lot more later on but i needed to do it in this case just so i had something which looked a bit more natural this is about context i did it so i had context of what how everything was going to interact with each other when i've got this perfectly smooth background and i've got brush strokes everywhere else that background just stands out like a sore thumb it just looks really out of place and the thing with that is is when you've got something that looks that out of place what it does is it distracts you so much that you can't see the the rest of the issues or the rest of the parts that need work so remember it's a process of elimination just like when we're doing non-mets just like when we're doing anything else you need to eliminate issues or potential issues to let us see other things so just by adding some glazes 
like not a lot i'm going to do so much more to it but just by adding some of them it makes it look a little bit more natural it's no longer such a problem so what that tells me straight away next is the the next area that we have that comes towards us that next layer there are too many brush strokes in it there the basically what we need to remember is the more brush strokes that we have in an area or the more prominent the brush strokes are as well those brush strokes are definition those brush strokes are defining features and because we want this to this 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 layer to be far away we want it to be smoother because we're seeing less definition seeing less features so the next step that i have is the areas that you can see me painting over so the trees in the furthest background the landmass that's in the furthest background first of all i'm going over with a brighter paint i decided that all of the green that i have in those areas is too dark i don't want them to be so prominent i want them to be almost like the colors of the backdrop and i'm painting much smoother now now when i say that i'm not worried about a perfectly blended transition i'm not even worried about having loads of contrast in it this is another thing all I want is to minimize the brush strokes that are in it. Brush strokes are fine in it, but I don't want many of them. So the odd brush stroke will just kind of give us some definition and shape. Too many brush strokes will just make it look too detailed for something that is so far away. And that's really important. So when we talk about contrast, painting the backdrop is a little bit different because this is a canvas yes we want contrast but we want contrast on the piece itself not individual areas we only need contrast in individual areas when we want them very defined so those areas that are going to be closer to us or that we want as a feature mainly the main trees i want those will have a fair amount of contrast in value and that sort of stuff but what we need to focus on really when it comes to this when it comes to a backdrop is the contrast overall and the way we're doing this is we're going to have our contrast in value in light and dark by having the furthest away, further away the view is. So in this case, the center is going to be the brightest area. And then the closer you get towards the front, the closer this piece gets to you, the closer the view gets to you, you're getting much darker. So we just have dark and light as one across the whole piece. And then what were the other type of contrast that we're going to that we the other two types of contrast that we use on this canvas is on the main trees on the viewpoint that's nearly as close as us we start adding more saturated greens so what this does is the light the light of this cat back drop draws you into the center and then the saturation on the trees draws your eyes to the trees themselves and what will happen is is the main trees will also have a more have a more material surface so they'll have more texture in them and they'll have more definition so the light draws us in and then the saturation and the definition and material texture of the trees themselves the focal trees will draw your eye to those trees that's how we're creating contrast here so we're not too worried about it individually we're worried about it across the canvas itself because that's ultimately what we're doing here we're just painting a canvas with all of that in mind you you can see like this this layer right this distance of details i've genuinely just painted it all one color right you can see that as i keep going over this i'm just making all of the details disappear i'm removing brush strokes as we go i'm making it everything just less and less refined i'm making it all flatter like there's no contrast in these areas that I'm painting, it's all just one flat color. I will add a little bit of variation in colors and, and values later on, but it's just not a priority because overall, across the whole piece, I will have the contrast that I need. Right, that's it. That's the first part of this done. I mean, we're what, 45 minutes in and we're only halfway through, so. I really did need to split this into two videos. I hope that's okay. The other one is out today, so don't worry. You're getting both of them. As always, appreciate the support. I hope this is helpful. Catch you later.